But I do think we would benefit w with a broader array of choices on both sides of the aisle here. Yes. You tweeted, so, which is why I've been supportive of multiple people. Well, including Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yes. Are you supporting him? Uh, I'm certainly, I, I like that his voice is in the race, for sure. And I'm uh, meeting him for the first time actually tomorrow. Have so you given I, him any money yet? Uh, I have, I've written him a check, yes. So I think some would look at that and say, how could somebody who was so emotional about COVID, you came on my program, we all remember that, mm -hmm. as committed you were as you were to the vaccine and getting as many people vaccinated mm -hmm. as possible, given his stance on vaccines in general, some might wonder how you can be supportive. So actually, I think Kennedy raises a, a lot of important questions that need to be asked and answered about vaccines. And, uh, and that's something that we are doing a deep dive on. Uh, just today, I was on the phone with a scientist and we wanna to put together, what I, what I think needs to be done is a very detailed deep dive into all of the research on vaccines, on vaccine safety, uh, and then, you know, what we, among the things we have not done a lot of work on is the cumulative impact uh, on a child, for example, of, you know, when I was a child, I got three shots. I have a four-year-old, she's, the schedule is to get 73 shots. You know, it's, and it may not be the, you know, the, the, the virus, if you will, the, the, that it's designed to make you immune to a particular disease or the, or the um, you know, dead virus or, or the mRNA technology. It may be, you know, aluminum or some of the other preservatives are used in vaccines, which create, uh, create risks and, and challenges. And by the way, as a parent of a four-year-old, uh, where the four-year-old has no ability to consent to your injecting something into them, I feel a moral and other paternal obligation to get to the bottom of this issue. I think, Mike, I just spoke to a scientist today, top scientist at UCSF, who said to me, you know, Kennedy is right on 75 to 80 percent of the stuff he says about vaccines. The unfortunate thing is there's a 20 to 25 percent uh, where unfortunately there's just not enough data for the stuff he says, is, says convincingly. And, and uh, so I, I think it's time for us, you know, this whole vaccine thing became a political issue where, um, you know, if you got a shot and, and wore a mask, you were on one party. If you refused to get a shot and didn't wear a mask, you were another political party. It's just not a political issue. And there is real reason Look, we, we have a generation of kids uh, who have a lot more uh, asthma, have a lot more eczema, have a lot more um, autism, and we don't yet understand the reason for that. And is it some, the adjuvant in the, in the vaccine? Is it something about vaccines? Is it some other toxins in the environment? I think we have an obligation as parents to figure this out before, you know, the, before we could keep... Uh, is that, is that you know, where this new found curiosity came from, from you becoming a parent? No, from actually listening to what Kennedy had to say, as opposed to, look, the biggest, I would say, interesting, I'll give a lot of credit to Elon uh, and Twitter or X, what do you want to call it? This, you know, I was talking to, again, a scientist today who's a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, epidemiologist um, and among other issues. And he was one of the scientists slash doctors that raised questions about our approach to uh, the COVID vaccine, and he was demoted on Twitter, uh, and some of the papers he put up on a uh, one of the preprint sites were like taken down as misinformation, and uh, you know, and uh, you look at this guy Jay Bhattacharya at, at, at uh, Stanford, his recommendations for how we should have managed COVID turned out to be pretty much spot on accurate, but he was basically just you know taken off Twitter as misinformation, and and now Twitter has become a place where people can express their views. And I, I'm a huge free speech advocate, and I, I, try, I use Twitter. Look, some of the most profitable investments, uh, well, the, the most, one of the most profitable investments I've ever made, I, I, I made because of what I learned on Twitter, which was the, the COVID, the trade we made where we bought um, CDS. I, I, it was clear to me that it was a very high probability event that COVID would be here, we'd have to shut the global economy. And I learned that because I could take a dispassionate view and collect data without without it, um, uh, at least that, th those topics were, were, were yet to be uh, uh, screened, if you will. And uh, you know, Elon has basically opened up Twitter now. And you know, the downside to a very open format is there, there's gonna be some hate speech, there's gonna be some things that people don't like. 
The upside is free speech has been a critical, uh, you know, sort of tenant of our country's principles and, and helps preserve the democracy. Um, so I'm, I, I find that to be a really important vehicle. And on Kennedy, I read the headlines and ha always had a perception he was a total wacko. And then I spent some time spending, you know, several hours listening to him in a podcast, doing some more work on him as a person. I said, you know, he's raising some really important points on vaccines I hadn't thought about. And so I would say, uh, you know, a year ago, I would have automatically taken a booster. Now I'm going to think about risk and reward, and, and I don't think it makes sense for me. It may make sense for someone who has health issues, who's older. But you, vaccines have risk and reward, and you have to do the calculus as to whether the risk justifies the reward. And I, I really hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about it prior to Kennedy, and I give him a lot of credit for that.